recording. Hi, this is uh, the Prostate Cancer Lab. Uh, I will read the, the disclaimers, uh, uh, set it up and turn it over to Brian. This is gonna be a great session. Um, as everyone knows, this is uh, for information purposes only. This is not medical advice. If you need medical advice, please consult your medical professional. And uh, the second thing is, uh, this will be made public. This uh, trans the transcript of the, everything you say and the, the images that are here, we will publish this uh, recording of this as well as um, uh, a transcript and notes from this. So if you would rather not be public, turn off your camera, turn you know, change your name to something <laughs> that isn't uh, recognizable and don't speak if you're concerned. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Brian, who's going to give us a summary of this is we're approaching the one year anniversary. We started this in March of last year. So we were approaching the one year anniversary. So it's very appropriate to take stock and see what we've learned and what the community is that we've built. And, and um, Brian will kind of share some analysis he's done. And, and I just want to qualify this. This is the first time that we've shared this. So it's very, you know, rough draft. Please think of it in, in a, it's not a finished product. It's just a working document. And for everyone here in the audience, our request is that you help us make it better. So if there's questions and things that you think we should be doing, that's the spirit with which we will be sharing this. Like what would be useful to you is the, is the, um, the, the starting point. So with that, Brian. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for joining. And I'm going to have a riveting presentation today. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it's going to be a little bit more of a weather report than, than anything. Um, and the reason I say that is I was kind of going through and aggregating this data. Uh, I remembered my days when I was working in sort of business intelligence and realized that there was a paradigm, which was, you know, 80% of the work is in like data aggregation and maybe the other 20% is in analytics and, or 10% analytics and then 10% decision-making. Um, over the course of the past, um, I don't know how many hours, I realized that that 80% rule is 100% accurate. So, um, and it, you know, it, it also uh, goes to the point that everything that we're doing right now is manual. And as we have the president of AWS with us here wearing his shirt, hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to get to a much more uh, automated process to look at our data. So this is very much a, a crawl, walk, run. We're definitely in the crawl stage. So let me share with you what I have and we'll go from there. Okay. So... First off, um, you know, we have uh, 10 patients, uh, one of them or a couple here aren't, aren't pictured, but we have uh, 10 patients that are part of the prostate cancer lab. And the way that we've set this up is that each of the patients are sharing their electronic medical record information and their genomic reports or omics reports to a Google Drive. And what I've done is I've taken that Google Drive and I've looked across each of the various patients. And I use this as kind of like a checklist. And then also it could, you know, eventually become something more of like an analytic tool. But I'm looking at um, essentially the information from their genomics, uh, looking at primary tumor, RNA seq, what kind of data are we getting from their met tumor? Um, are, you know, what kind of insights are we getting from liquid biopsies, germline, other tests uh, such as ARV7, HLA, IHC, et cetera. Um, and then I'm also looking at their electronic medical records. So everyone has some report, whether it's from MD Anderson or UCSF or wherever, and all of that, all that information is, um, is, in the, is in the Google Drive. And then I have a section around treatment options. And so, as you know, we have a marketplace of um, very generous service providers such as CureMatch, Massive Bio, XCures, Cancer Commons, Shepherd Therapeutics, Genomic Expression, uh, CRI, M-Probe, um, and hopefully some others. And essentially what I'm doing, and you're gonna see this, uh, 
as we kind of go through, uh, I'm kind of tracking how patients are kind of moving through the funnel. And each one of these, um, each one of these, these uh, cells, uh, you can see it's sort of like underlined, they actually hyperlink to the document in the Google Drive. So this is sort of the process in terms of how I was looking across our data sets. And, you know, this is about as basic as you can possibly get. So we're using Excel, we're using Google Drive, and we're not using any kind of analytic um, tool um, to really connect data. Uh, so this is just a, a starting point. But, you know, sometimes when you kind of get your your hands dirty, you, you begin to kind of understand how this information can come together with more sophisticated tools. So, you know, this is very much a, you know, as I said, a crawl, walk, run process. So um, one of the tools that I found yesterday online was this really cool mapping software. And I wanted to take a look at where all of our patients are. And you know, we're all connected. We are coast to coast from sea to shining sea. And um, these are our patients. I have pictures for everyone with the exception of uh, Phil Resch. So Noel, I know that you're on the line. Um, Maybe you've given it to Brad. I couldn't find it. So there's going to be some gaps in the data here. But um, but anyway, when you when you get a chance, um, you know, send that our way. Um, but at least you can see that uh, you know we have good coverage of the United States. But hopefully, you know, we're we're going to be able to fill in um, all of the states and uh, get uh, get greater representation, uh, you know, across the country. Um, we also are you know, looking to get uh, more ethnic diversity uh, in our um, in our group. Um, so uh, so if you know people that um, that want to join us, uh, we've already had a little bit of that, you know, the, the word of mouth marketing, um, but continue to do that. And particularly if you know African-Americans, as many of you may know, um, African-Americans have much higher rates of prostate cancer um, uh, relative to the, their population uh, than other uh, racial groups. And uh, this is a, a big focus of the Prostate Cancer Foundation and also of the American Cancer Society. And I think that we need to reflect that in our community as well. So one of the things that I wanted to look at was, you know, just how are our patients moving through what I would call our treatment funnel. So as I mentioned, you know, our objective is to integrate electronic medical record information and multi-omic insights to guide treatment decisions. And so if we look at how our patients are moving through that process, um, you know, we have 10 patients. The good news is we have all of them have some electronic medical record information, and all of that is is in, integrated into the Google Drive. Um, all of them actually have some genomic information. Um, I'm going to come back to Chad. I, Chad, I know, has um, genomic information. Chad, we're going to probably have to have a conversation offline um, in terms of some of the reports that you have because um, this just requires interpretation. Uh, so, you know, we're doing pretty well in terms of collecting the data sets that are required to get to treatment decisions. And so if you look at this, you know, prostate cancer lab treatment options, this is the aggregation of all of our service providers. So Excures Cancer Commons, CureMatch, et cetera, um, looking at the patients that have taken advantage of those services. So about half of them have, um, and there are varying degrees, and we'll kind of get into that a little bit as well. Um, and of those five, two have had uh, guided treatment decisions from that insight. So as we kind of pull back a little bit, you know, I think that there are some, there's some low hanging fruit, you know, again, because we have this data, um, it, it's, it's really easy to leverage it. And, you know, Low hanging fruit would be going after Cancer Commons, X Cures, Massive Bio, and Cure Match. And the reason I say that is that their processes to ingest information are very simple. Everybody that's, you know, all of our patients have that data that's required to 
uh, feed those recommendation engines. And then it gets a little bit more complicated when you get into Mprobe and Shepherd, but not too much. Um, and we're working through like Shepherd right now, but um, you know, there's really no reason why that number of five shouldn't be 10. And you know, I, I know that it can be sometimes daunting to just pull all this information together and, and go out and 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 have conversations um, and start these processes. What I would just offer is that um, if you need my help to do that, I've done it for other folks. I'd be happy to do it for you. So just uh, just reach out to me, and uh, I'll help get you uh, get you started. But it is important because you know um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to elevate the conversation between the patient and the care provider. And there are two ways that we do that. One is through these sessions, these Wednesday sessions, where we offer essentially master classes on, you know, really cutting edge stuff. And the second way that we we facilitate that conversation or or raise the, the water level of intelligence is to offer these treatment opportunities. And I can tell you, since I've gone through this process, that it it really is very, very helpful. And you know, I think you guys have heard that I went into my oncologist, I had aggregated across, you know, these vendors 21 different treatment options. And my med onc went through 21 of them, whittled them down to eight, and then finally to three. And uh, now we're about ready to pull the trigger on one of those. So um, anyway, it's it's a, it's an easy process, but I, I understand that, you know, there's a lot going on just in terms of managing your disease. And uh, I just offer up that if I can help to, you know, to uh, to establish these these relationships with these vendors and get these processes moving, I'm happy to help you. Okay, so there's a lot of data here, and I'm going to try to um, whittle down. I was trying to think of a, another way of showing this. Partly, what I'm trying to give you is just a subset of information, which hopefully shows the interconnectivity um, between our patient groups. So we have 10 patients here, and um, there's a few core different components that I'm looking at. So what's the age? What are the years living with this disease? So that's from the date of diagnosis. Where are you being treated? Who's treating you? I'm looking at Gleason score as well, um, because we're all advanced. I would expect um, nothing below an eight. Uh, Rick is an outlier here at seven. There are a few folks here where they don't have Gleason scores. Um, and that's just something that's um, that just requires pathology and um, some follow-up there, or sometimes it may be hard to do. Um, I've looked at met, uh, met location. So as we know, um, or we've heard, 85% of prostate cancer patients have bone mets. And uh, you can see we actually track uh, a little bit below that. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So about 60% of us have bone mets and the other have either a combination of uh, soft tissue or lymph node. Uh, so that's interesting. I've also looked at uh, gene alterations uh, and then I've taken a just a very brief snapshot of the treatments that all of you have gotten. Um, so I have included, you know, surgeries and radiation. I didn't get into the number of each of these different um, elements. I also did not include any first line hormone therapies such as Lupron or Firmagon or Rubraca. Uh, or dutasteride, I've, I've left those off because essentially all of us are getting those. So these are really looking at second line hormone therapies, chemotherapy, uh, immunotherapy, et cetera. And so you can kind of see uh, what we have here relative to key treatments. And then I just did um, a quick scan of the systemic therapies that each of you have, have received. And then um, I, I kind of pulled a, an interesting metric, was, which is to look at just simply the years that each of you is getting for each systemic therapy. So for example, if you look at me, 
Um, I've had five systemic therapies over six and a half years. On average, I'm getting about, you know, a year and a quarter uh, or a year and a third from each therapy. And that's kind of interesting. Um, there is an outlier here. There are a couple of a, few, uh, a couple of outliers here. On the high end, you see here down at the bottom, Ken Anderson. Uh, Ken has been living with the disease for you know six years. He's at MD Anderson. You know he's got a high Gleason, so he's got aggressive cancer. He's got bone mets. He only has one alteration. Now it's possible that that's changed, but I I don't think so. Um, uh, and he's only been on three treatments. What's really fascinating about Ken is that he had, I believe, over 25 um, uh, infusions of docetaxel. I want to say 28, but but over 25. Uh, he's been on Plavicto and he's currently on BAT. And so he's getting, you know, just over two years per systemic therapy that he's taking. Um, and then on the low end, you know, unfortunately, you know, Mike uh, is at uh, 0.4. So he's getting, you know, less than six months per systemic therapy. Um, we're hopeful that, you know, the findings that he has right now from MPRO, where he's taking the top aside and carboplatin, uh, which was completely off the radar before he had his uh, analysis from MPRO that, you know, he's hopefully going to be able to get a longer duration uh, of response from that particular therapy. So, you know, as you can see here on, on the right-hand side, you know, the average number, uh, the average years of folks are living with the disease is about 3.8 years, and that's, that's growing. Uh, the min is 0.6. Uh, so, uh, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that that patient died, it just means that they were just recently diagnosed. In this case, it's, it's Eric Hall, um, who's, um, who's doing quite well. It's just, he's very early in his disease and the max is six and a half. Um, and we talked a little bit about the years of systemic therapy. Um, so, you know, I wanted to kind of create like a, a fancy graph that would kind of like have connectors from one patient to another, but I'm going to let you kind of like look at this and, and look for connections um, between this network of patients that we have as you're thinking about your next therapy, uh, as you're thinking about perhaps your gene alterations, your condition, you know, um, you, should, you should be reaching out to patients uh, who look like you. And that's already happened. Um, so we know that um, each of you has been really, really amazing in terms of offering insights uh, to other patients. And as this network grows, hopefully, you know, we're going to have even a, a stronger network effect. So I'm going to pause there for just a second. Um, I, I, I also just want to note, um, Chad, as you can see here, your gene alterations I have not included, and that's because I need to go through with you that huge report that you have. Um, it was a little confusing, and so I know that we've been trying to do that, uh, but we'll, we'll need to take that offline. I know that you have gene alterations. I think you've got you have p53, but I'm not 100% sure of that. Uh, but we'll just need to take that offline. So I, I'm hoping again to to actually get to this view for each of you. Uh, it, it it actually required a, a bit of a bit of work. I hope that I didn't get you know uh, things wrong, um, but uh, but I'm happy to update this and correct it with you offline. So I'm going to pause because there's a fair bit of data here uh, to ask, see if there are any questions. There's one in the chat from Rebecca. You might want to. Okay. Oh, okay. Is there a plan in place via consent to ask for your XML database or XML file of the report from labs? This allows for structured data to be captured and analyzed. Companies have a hard time getting these. Yeah, so I, I get the nature of your question. So we don't have a plan to do that right now, Rebecca, um, but this is clearly something that we need to do. Um, 
or we would need to, you know, potentially even partner with with you all because I'm pretty sure that, uh, you know, that Xcures has that. I think it's Xcures. They uh, don't. That's why I brought it up. Um, they, uh, they, they, the laboratories, because of their statements of monetizing data, they will not give it to them. Uh, they mm -hmm. feel like direct competition, but. I think that patients, people need to get uh, a little bit more familiar with what they're asking for, especially as you as the patient can ask for that and the laboratories will give it. You just have to have a place to put it. So um, I think there's opportunities and I, and as you're you know analyzing similarities in that, it just makes mm -hmm. some of this because you, you started this off by talking about automation. So mm -hmm. that's why I'm bringing that up because it would make some of these analysis between all your patients and not, each one of you a lot easier. For sure, you know this. This is just kind of like raw ingredients right now, and yep. you know, uh, it's yeah. I the, it's a highlight, you know, food for thought. Um, yeah, the not a, you know, I just think people aren't asking for this, and they will give it to you. So um, just to kind of a, you know, let you know. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great opportunity. So thank you for that. You know, uh, that's something that we can we can definitely. Um, follow up on. Any other questions? I want to compliment you, Brian. This is a big step forward. I think the 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 thing you added about years per systemic therapy is something that we've been sensing, but it's nice to see it all laid out in numbers because people like Mitt and Mike, you know, are, are really fighting a more difficult battle. So th thanks for thanks for all your work on this. Yeah, um, it's a, it, right. Yeah, you know, you start putting it together and uh, you start running into things. And so, you know, this is still scratching the surface of, of understanding the relationships between each of these different patients. And of course, as you get more data, then, you know, you're going to get more robust um, uh, relationships. So uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, continuing to, to flesh this out and build upon it. Yeah, I, I don't know that I've ever seen years per systemic therapy as a met metric, but it kind of shows when you're patient led. That's exactly what you'd want to know. For sure. You know, um, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that this is pretty, pretty accurate too. Um, you know, I, I went through a, a fair bit of work just to make sure that I, I captured all of the treatments going through the EMR records to make sure that, you know, that I, that I was accurate. I'm, I'm sure I've missed something in here. Um, but, um, you know, we need to change this. <laughs> Bottom yeah, line. Yeah. yeah. Brian, I was just going to comment. You know, you've done pretty good here with with respect to me because that's been the issue with with my particular cancer is that any therapy I take has no durability. I mean, basically, once you complete your treatment, you get two to three months after that at best, and then <laughs> the cancer's on the run again. And so, yeah, I think this is a this is a great metric that you put together here, and it's it's close enough to accurate that it looks pretty good to me. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. All right, so um, let's just kind of continue on. Hopefully. Wait, Saeed had his hand up. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, hi, Brian. Thank you. I, I have two uh, comments actually. First, about your idea of eighty percent uh, about data, and a little bit about the analytics. I agree, but I, I changed it a little bit to the sixty percent and thirty percent to feature extraction and 10% to modeling. And if you look at even deep learning, the modeling component is just the old uh, neural network model, right? The uh, feature extraction is the most important. And the second point here is still in many of presentation, I see exploration. We just explore data. We just explore our uh, uh, situation. and Exploration doesn't uh, give us the answer to our question. We should start with the question. What our patients, they have a question. They want to know, is this drug is better than the other drug for them? In this situation, if I get uh, this surgery, what's the probability of recurrence? We need to change this approach, honestly, because we should start with the question and say, mm -hmm. can we find an answer to those questions based on the data we have in our electronic record? Uh, as I mentioned this one before, we have more than 5 million omics data, 5 million plus. 
omics data in the public domain field, but we are not using it. And this is it. This is it. Uh, still, we are just trying to explore. Say, this is our, my situation. This is my friend's situation. Okay, then so what? What's what? What's the end of this exploration? We need to find those gold nuggets, and that's that needs to change the way we are uh, working with our data. That's yeah, my I, I I agree a hundred percent, Saeed. Uh, and, and Rick is going to share with you some work that he's been doing um, right after I, I present this that will kind of talk a, a little bit about sort of the um, the community that we're building and the recommendations that are uh, different recommendations that are coming from different providers in, for him in, in his case. And so how is it that you can First, you have to have the data inputs, and then you kind of have to have enough data to to model well, which one do we actually think is right. But I, you know, I, I maybe somebody's figured this out. I mean, there's been so many people that have been working on this problem for you know a lot longer than I have. That's for darn sure. Um, but you know, Rick's going to show sort of like the next iteration of what we're thinking about in terms of having a more holistic view of patient data. Um, that that captures this community and the recommendations that the community is providing for treatment options. So he'll share that soon. Okay, let's see if I can just figure out how to advance my screen. And there we go. Okay, so um, just real briefly, you know, TP53 is far and away the, the most prevalent um, gene alteration that we have, followed by Temprosur, um, P10, and then a lot of, um, you know, just um, single, single gene alterations. Across all of our patients, there is no commonality in combinations. Um, everyone has a different flavor of of gene alterations we may share one or two across the network um, but in totality there's no patient here that looks exactly the same as others you know so on average um, we have you know three three um, three alterations at minimum one max is six um, we did look at germline uh, of nine patients that have gotten germline uh, six have negative and three have actionable uh, 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 genes. So uh, this is sort of just like a, a high level look at what our genomics look like. And this is just sort of looking at the omics landscape. So one of the things that, that we're trying to do is to move patients into uh, more sophisticated testing. And so, you know, if you look at DNA, you know, we've got plenty of vendors that do NGS uh, for us. Uh, you know, all 10 of our patients have it. Um, you know, several are using uh, the, the prostate tissue for that. Some are using that tumor and then some are sort of questionable. I couldn't quite figure out what this what the sample uh, was uh, for the for the test. Um, we have also very good rep representation for germline. So nine of us uh, have those and these are some of the vendors that we're using. Uh, usually comes from either blood or saliva. Uh, in one case, uh, we also had a, a second uh, test that was uh, uh, from tissue. Um, then as it, it flows down into DNA and RNA, we look at whole exome sequencing and RNA-seq. Uh, we've got a few vendors that play in that ar arena. Um, and there are four of us that have uh, whole exome sequencing. Uh, three of those have come from prostate tissue, uh, one from met tumor, and, you know, now we're getting into, into proteomics and mass spectrometry. Uh, we're very fortunate in that MPRO has offered to provide our patients free of charge uh, proteomic tests. Uh, Mike Yancey is blazing the trail on that. Uh, and uh, uh, he recently, I guess about a month ago, uh, received his report and uh, has already changed his, his um his treatments uh, based upon that insight. I'm having a conversation today with my 
uh, with my medical oncologist, and I'm going to be uh, going after uh, proteomics as well with her. I'm also going to be pushing spatial phenotyping too. So the point is, is that uh, we need to keep moving farther down uh, in, into deeper diagnostics. I recognize that there are some challenges for us. Uh, for those of us who have bone mets, it's harder to get some of these tests. Uh, sometimes it requires a bone aspirate, et cetera. Um, but uh, for those that, that don't have bone mets, um, some of these tests um, could be available to you. And so, you know, as you, as you talk to your, your doctors about this, uh, you should be going after, you should know, for example, that, that you know, we can get proteomic testing for free uh, for you. And so uh, I mentioned that before uh, on Circle, our collaboration tool. Um, but again, I'm just going to reiterate that, that you know, we really should continue to push the envelope to get more data uh, and deeper, deeper insights. So just in summary, you know, we have a, a really engaged patient group, uh, super, super thankful for everyone. You know, I know it's sort of a hassle uh, to upload your docs into the Google Drive. What I've noticed is that many of you continue, or actually most of you continue to use the Google Drive to update your information, which, you know, which is, which is great. Um, it is a central, you know, uh, source for you, uh, as well as for this group to be able to hold your data. And that's awesome. Uh, we've seen examples um, of how patients are learning from each other. And, you know, that's always super expiring. And then, you know, uh, I just say, you know, there's this, uh, you know, refreshing your own mix should be considered if you've seen several lines of therapy. In terms of recommendations, you know, that's probably more of a recommendation than that last one, but in any event, um, use your existing data um, to get guided treatment options and, you know, get help from me if you need it. So this gets, goes back to the point that uh, you all have genomic information, um, but there's an opportunity to leverage our partners to get those guided treatment decisions. Um, the second is I just talked about, let's get deeper diagnostics if you can. Um, as you're getting your data, if you can get the right raw diagnostics from your vendor, then that's super helpful because you can just pick that up and then take it to another vendor uh, for, uh, for additional um, insights. An example of that is I'm currently working with uh, Mike uh, to, uh, to pull his, oh, he already has it. He already has his, his raw data from Tempest and then sending that over to Shepherd Therapeutics for them to run their RNA-seq analysis. Uh, I'm doing the same as well. So, um, and then the other thing is just, you know, talk to your physician about how to maximize the useful life of systemic therapies. You know, now you have some data that gives you insight on how long these are, are lasting. And perhaps there's a, a plan that you can build with your physician to extend the useful life of those therapies. I know that you know most doctors know that, um, but now you're armed with some data to uh, to to make that point uh, even stronger. And you also know where you where you fit on the bell curve. Um, so so that's it. So the there are two more things that I wanted to to chat about. So Mike, you had prepared a presentation, I think for a week or two ago. And this is essentially an encapsulation of your journey. I think you did an amazing job. So Mike, if you can kind of take us through this, this could be useful for other patients. Um, and then Rick, I'm gonna have you uh, chat about uh, how you've mapped your journey. Okay. Yeah, bas basically what I tried to show in this and, and I tried to cut off a few you know, high numbers, but just kind of noted them here in the left left corner. Uh, but basically, one interesting thing about me, of course, is that I always had annual physicals. And of course, in June 2019, my PSA was 1.2. Uh, a little over a year later, September 2020, it was 2.3. And then I was actually ended up in the hospital in July of 2021. And that's when I was diagnosed. And at that point in time, my PSA had jumped up to 50.66. And then 
as we got going, uh, you know, with some, some drugs, et cetera, had dropped to, to 12.34 in September of 2021. I, I guess the, the takeaway that everybody needs to know with me is that even though my cancer is very aggressive, it does not put out a lot of PSA with respect to how much cancer you have. So we basically use the PSA as just kind of a, as a reference point. So in some cases where people would, would have their PSA changed by, let's just say, 100 points, in my case, a, a change of 0.1 or 0.2 may be about the equivalent. So anyway, all that said, you know, as, as you can see here, you know, I basically began Lupron back uh, right after I got diagnosed August the 5th. And as you can see, my PSA drops down pretty good. I also started docetaxel uh, a few days thereafter at August 12th. So that worked. I finished up my docetaxel November 29th. And uh, at that point in time, of course, my PSA started to rise once again, and I began abiraterone April 13th. As you can see, abiraterone did absolutely nothing. Uh, effectively, everything kept kept climbing. And uh, then I finally got on the Plavicto treatments August 9th. And so as you can see, I kind of peak out shortly thereafter. And then, of course, with Plavicto, my PSA drops significantly. Now, one, one thing it's, that's not explicitly stated here is that we did discover in October of 2022 is that I had had mutations that were now attacking my spine, causing a couple of spinal cord compressions that did not put out PSMA, which is what Provicto targets on. Uh, and, and so therefore, that particular cancer also does not put out much in the way of PSA, so you don't see any, any jump at that point in time. Uh, so anyway, uh, basically I had to have some radiation to try to take care of all that. And we were rocking along pretty good. Uh, however, I did stop kind of my, my choice. My oncologist works with me pretty well. He's, I'm always willing to try something out of the box. And, you know, most oncologists would never, a person like me would never stop your ADT, your Lupron, if you will. Uh, I just want to see what happens. So basically I stopped it December 15th. And of course, uh, because of the of, of the uh, growing uh, lesions on my spine, we also could no longer go forward with the Victo, So we basically stopped that also on December 15th. And of course, I stopped abiraterone because it was doing absolutely nothing. And that's when, as, as Brian has already referenced, I began the chemo of toposide and carboplatin on, on January 16th. And as you can see, even though after I started that, my PSA, small numbers, but, but continued to drop. So basically, you know, in this slide, which you can see here, of course, is uh, the actual PSA numbers and in, in the green stripe there. But then I've tried to color code things to some degree in between radiation and plavicto. Plavicto is a form of radiation. Uh, and, and of course, I know the writing is very, very, very small here, but basically uh, that's all in the yellow. And then I tried to color code the ADT in the green. So that's kind of a combination of abiraterone and, and Lupron. And uh, uh, then, of course, second line home. I should say the, the abiraterone runs actually in the orange and then the chemo I've had, you know, two, two types of chemo at this point is in the red. So uh, the, the issue I've got is that this cancer in my spine is mutated, even though we did a biopsy. What was very interesting about it is it still retained most of the mutations that we'd had done with the bone from the original biopsy in July of 2021. Uh, as well as some liquid biopsies, et cetera. So it's remained relatively consistent. But I do expect that this cancer on my spine has also most likely lost all AR. In other words, it doesn't need testosterone. I'm hoping to try that out uh, as soon as I finish chemo. In other words, we're going we're gonna to finish chemo about June 1. I'm going to be uh, traveling a little bit uh, in July. But I'm hoping that... Uh, if when I get back, that we're probably going to see things starting to grow once again. And I'm going to try BAT, you know, bipolar androgen therapy. But because this new cancer is probably not interested in testosterone, we're probably going to see no change. We're not going to be able to see some results like other people have had with that. So hopefully I've given you a summary of that slide. Sorry to be so wordy. No, this is great. R really, I love how you laid this out. So, um, uh, tells a, a story and, uh, you know, a journey that you've been on. You know, it, it, uh, it, it would be great if we could understand all of these treatments and start looking them at, at, at you know, across patients um, relative to, um, you know, their biomarkers um, and other um, variables. And maybe Rick can 
can help us understand how he's thinking about it. So, Rick, I'm going to um, stop I, sharing here. Can I, just, can I just ask one quick quick question yeah. on the mics? This is the first I've ever heard of someone where the PSA, you know, is not really being a good biomarker. And we're really lucky in prostate cancer to have PSA as a marker of disease progression. And in his case, maybe PSMA is also not, you know, indicating what's going on because it's mutated around that. Are there any other biomarkers for disease progression for prostate cancer if those two are not working so well? Basically, I have to use all scans, both combination of PSMA, PET scans, as well as CT scans, et cetera. That's the only way we can keep up with, with what's happening. Uh, something very interesting in my case that we have discovered is that when my cancer really takes off and begins to grow, I start spiking fever. We're talking 103 degrees and up. And uh, so anytime that we've learned now, after a few uh, situations, that if anytime I get a fever that spikes, I better get into the oncologist pretty quick because we got a problem. And I think also you've had bone pain, if, if I remember. Well, that's another indicator for you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, basically the, the, the spiking fever and then shortly thereafter, followed by the bone pain. That's basically what happened to me at the end of December. I had, I had the spiking fever every evening for several days. And then by the uh, latter part of December after Christmas, the pain was so bad I could not walk. And that's when I ended up in the hospital. Yeah, just, just one comment on that too, uh, Brad. I have a, a low PSA relative to my tumor volume. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a real issue. Um, there is a friend of our community, I, I, won't, uh, I won't name him, but he is working right now on identifying another biomarker for, uh, for prostate cancer. Um, I, he seemed pretty optimistic about it, uh, but it hasn't been published. And so I don't know exactly where we are, but uh, I know that there, he, at least one person is working on it. Okay, so uh, we've only got about 15 minutes left. Uh, and Rick, I, I want, I teed you up earlier, I want you to share what you're working on uh, in terms of capturing your state and how that's sort of an aggregation of what um, we're doing at the Prostate Cancer Lab to, uh, to capture so many different insights. Sure. <clears throat> I'm sharing my screen now. Hopefully you guys can see it. It's uh, I look at things through a database view, an automation view, uh, AI view. And I thought about, okay, what is the value of our cancer patient lab, our prostate cancer patient lab? Why, why do we take the time to get together? You know, and it's, it's to give. I've, I'm giving, I mean, I could be playing guitar. I could be playing golf or whatever. I could still be doing, spending time with my wife, but it's a balance and I want to give, but there's also a need to get some value out. Okay. So we need some value to keep coming. So uh, I tried to think of, okay, what, what's, what do we get out of here? You know, and, and basically to me, before I delve into this slide is, um, decisions, you know, when, when things are working well, uh, I don't really need this group that bad. And I, I shift more towards giving, but when things are not working well and, you know, the therapy parachute that I'm on starts to fail, I, I need help. So um, I kind of thought of, well, how can we create a report or a summary of a patient that uh, captures the value that our lab gives through this collective knowledge? So here's my cut at the report for me. Um, and I know it's small, so I'll zoom in a little bit. So hopefully you guys can see uh, it. Um, so I start off with just the basics, you know, who I am, uh, my treatments. Uh, I thought Brian's uh, summary was excellent. So this could all be put in a database pretty easy. Uh, and here's my RNA. So here, here's kind of what's going on with me from uh, 
20,000 foot view. Here's a graphic. You can see my uh, Mets here with the red lines going, uh, they're nodal. Uh, so my metastases are in my lymph nodes. The one I feel most is in the center of my chest. So I know Pluvicto is working when I'm not driving along, minding my own business, and there's a discomfort or starting to be pain in my chest. That's when things are not working. And when that disappears, uh, I know Pluvicto is working independent of any biomarker. And that's like this guy right here. So anyway, uh, I'm going to go fast now. So here's my little treatments. It looks like Mike's. Uh, I think we should standardize to whatever makes sense. Here's what I'm doing uh, for supplements and, you know, exercise. But here, here it comes down to what's the value to me when I'm in trouble. Okay, so for right now, uh, you know, I failed a few, uh, uh, I basically failed docetaxel. I was on a clinical trial that failed. And I went, and so my guidance at that time, uh, Dr. McKay, Blue Victo, and she was an angel to make it available to me because it's not available to everyone. Um, you can just see the uh, complete consensus on Blue Victo. You know, some doctors said maybe, you know, combination. Uh, Dr. Shen at UCLA mentioned that there's other clinical trials that I could consider if I couldn't get Blue Victo, but I should get Blue Victo. So I didn't do. Um, massive bio, and I should. I, di I didn't do a few of these other vendors because it was really clear. And uh, Cancer Commons, thank you to Emma Chivalry, Chivalman. Uh, but it was really obvious. Okay, what should I do? Ian Cure Match, thank you, Allie. Um, um, when I asked Dr. Uh, McKay, could I do something else with Pluvicto? She just said, nah, just do Pluvicto. So, I mean, uh, you know, but it was it was clear what should i do next it was that's the value and there was one other value as i was deemed to be castrate resistant uh by dr mckay and dr shen since i had failed darlutamide um i was like in bad shape and i couldn't get pluvicto for like six weeks so why did it start why did i go from hey i'm in trouble this is 13 uh, and doubling up pretty damn fast uh, to it went down suddenly. That was because of this prostate cancer lab. You know, we talked with uh, Brian, Brad, and Bryce Olson, and uh, Bryce came up with the idea, hey, well, why don't you try abiraterone? And I go, well, I've been deemed to be castrate resistant. It's not going to work. Uh, Dr. McKay said, don't do it. Dr. Shen said, don't do it. But Dr. Bryce Olson, and I say that with a wink, uh, said, hey, you got nothing to lose. Let's try it. Well, talk about a value I had from Prostate Cancer Lab. I went for, I mean, from a very scary slope to an actual reduction prior to my first pluvicto. So clear um, value. And then, so here, here's what everyone said, I can kind of look at, well, you know, here's all the ideas and I'm, I'm still want to get X cures and shepherd and uh, anything I can because I'm coming to the end of Pluvicto and I'm going to have to have a plan. So my plan right now is to continue Pluvicto and Abiraterone, um, continue diet. It, I'm tuning my diet and exercise with the block center. Um, uh, more on that later. And I think we should all investigate personalized vaccine if that's an option for us. And then basically look into other options. Um, you know, everyone hopes that uh, we can push this down and get, and get some uh, altitude, so to speak. So this to me, uh, in summary, is uh, the value here. And this value will go into the collective, but it's also me benefiting from this camp, from being associated with this cancer lab, not only in knowledge and how I interact with my oncologists, but kind of a place for me to go, okay, what do I do next? What are all my inputs? Is there a consensus? Okay, so that's me. Uh, I did a similar one 
uh, for Kevin, I don't have as much information, but I did a little graph and uh, here you can kind of see how we did on abiraterone uh, for 46 trial. I don't even know what that is, but uh, as it started to fail and how he's doing on cabazitaxel. So it's just really easy to, see. this is like, I, I can see what's going on. I can see what he's been on and how he's responding. Okay, and then my last minute, uh, this is not that hard to do. I actually have done this in an automated sense. Uh, this is how to program a render a creation of a PDF from a database. Um, this is code uh, in React. This uh, is hosted on AWS. Uh, this is the CSS, start of the PDF layout. So basically you have an HTML driving a PDF and, and it's pulling data such as this is Kevin, this is Rick, this is Mike. So this is a, just a glimpse of what that code looks like. And then um, this is um, the full code base that I've worked out uh, for um uh, hosting web and mobile applications on AWS. It uses like this fantastic tool called Amplify Deployment. It has security, world-class security, it uses uh, AWS um, databases and a brand new non-SQL. It's called GraphQL. It's really an amazing database structure query engine. Um, and then the graphics are, uh, in a JavaScript library, D3, which stands for Data Driven Documents, and the code base is React. Here's all the upper level. The source code goes down into here. Um, and then the components, this is where the little rubber meets the road. Uh, like, uh, here's the here's how you, here's the JavaScript file that I just showed you to generate the PDF, how to upload data. Um, how to do stopwatches and tabs and what have you. So that's, I don't want to dwell on that, but um, anyway, that's uh, one way that we can address automation. And I think it's really important that we consider the value that we give to patients rather than we just collect and suck like uh, other entities. So Rick, I mean, I, what I love about this is the, the guidance summary component. I mean, I, you know, um, all the PSA charts are, are awesome. I think they're kind of like baseline for what we're doing. You've done a really good job of showing it. I mean, how, how difficult would it be to um, take this and then create it for the other patients? Super simple. I mean, if we give every patient a little excel file a template and say you know uh who's your doctor uh you know what whatever you want to put in it uh, we, we create a template so it's standardized and it goes up and you know i've created the portal or whoever it, it doesn't matter uh as rebecca knows uh once you standardize your input uh that's the hardest thing so we could create an Excel file template and say, okay, all patients just jot this, you know, put this in so that you don't have to go combing through different disparate records. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the power of this is just to, you know, to have almost like a, uh, like a molecular tumor board that's kind of weighing in and have all the insights centralized. You know, all yeah. of us have, all of us have received, as you just, shown here although you're 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 um, pretty consistent but um we all get different inputs and different uh recommendations um if there's a way to to present that uh you know uh to a, the, a community of doctors through a molecular tumor board that could be very very powerful yeah, I mean, this is like we look at Kevin or any of us and you just like go, hmm, what are we going to do next? Um, and it'd be good to have a plan because you do, let's say we all, I think it, if you look at pessimistically, we're all going to fail something sometime. 
Um, although that I don't really believe that's true. I still have hope. But, uh, you know, we're all going to have challenges on our journey. And just knowing what's ahead or, or having a contingent plan is just a great idea. And it, I know for me, it takes a lot of the worry. I mean, the most worried I've ever been is when I'm failing a, a therapy I'm on, I'm going to shit. And then it's not really clear what I should do because I'm already at the end of NC, CN, NCCN guidelines and it's very unnerving time, which doesn't help. So get that proactive. I think that's part of what our lab offers is that kind of awareness. Okay, what, what what's coming up next? Yep, Rick? Can I ask Rick a question? Sure. I mean, um, well, thank you and Brian, whatever, for all of the efforts you put in. And I don't have the ability to create all the Excel stuff, but if I understood there, so I've had like one result since I sent you my stuff, I'm going to have a scan and looking at Provicto. Is it the type of thing that if I had, an Excel file that I could continue to just add things in as opposed to keep sending things to you to have you do it? Um, the way I designed the system that I made is that uh, anyone that we wish to grant security authority can upload directly without a, a steward or a so in answer, Kevin, uh, however it wants to be set up, AWS provides the ability to have full security and uh, how I've uploaded data into uh, the cloud um, is via a little portal and that will suck in that uh, Excel file. And if you change it, it'll suck in the changes. And if uh, we as a group say, hey, we want everyone to be able to do their own thing, then it's open. It's it's super simple. It's actually kind of fun <laughs> because my son, Eric, put a little timer on it. And so it's like, OK, up, uploading, you know, a thousand records in one point eight seconds. You see this little progress bar and a timer and you go, oh, wow, it's, you know, I don't know. It's, he's a gamer and he, you know, he made it kind of fun. So um, you can see the little clock going so we however the group wants to do it it's it's wide open it's easy to set the security you just add okay kevin can do everything or kevin can only alter his own records or whatever you want to do well yeah i would only want to alter my records and if i goof something up or had a question but the thrust of it was to even for people like myself to be able to share some of the burden or not to become a little more independent on some of this and as it grows to have some of you guys that are doing so much on our behalf not have to do everything that's a great thought thanks for that sentiment and you know we're i think the most important thing is what do we capture? I mean, I kind of glossed over sort of Brian on, you know, here's our initial thoughts. These thoughts are need to be evolved. And, uh, you know, I know Kevin, uh, you know, all of us, Eric's going to, hey, you didn't think of this. And uh, that's one thing nice about the database structure that I set up. But, um, hey, we didn't even have a field for this. And uh, it's easy to add with this uh, DynamoDB non-sql database you can it's non-structured so you can put in images or scans or data whatever in in our remaining time uh uh how can we make this better a site i think you had your hand up you had something you wanted to say or comment but particularly for the patients is there anything that you would want to see added like you'd want to know about the other patients or anything that has come to mind for you Oh, it, as I said, honestly, it depends on the question. Uh, for example, I see this one here. I believe there is another biomarker from Rick. 
need to be checked, right? Uh, based on the question we have, we need to organize our data, uh, data. But at the end, I believe the number one source of data is the uh, electronic record. We, for, for this group, for the prostate cancer group, we need to do our best. It, can we have access to those data, right? Somehow anonymize it. And because at the end, if we don't have that data, we are just repeating the same thing again and again. We need, we need data in order to answer a question properly. That's, that's one thing. It means if, if otherwise uh, 10 patients data doesn't help, right? And it's, it's just a guessing game. Uh, then uh, as a group, we should work together, say how we can get that data out of it. If there is, as I said, some public data, how we can get those data and put it in one place. Then to me, it's, uh, as uh, Brian mentioned, this first is about the data. Uh, we need to have access data. And 10 patient data is just the guessing game. Yeah, that's an interesting thought, Saeed. Um... For sure. I mean, this is sort of like data exploration that we were doing today. You know, this was like sort of like first blush of like, okay, like what does our landscape of, of patients look like? Um, it's a small data set, as you noted. And maybe there are opportunities for us to partner uh, with uh, folks who have larger data sets and use our perspective in terms of what we want as patients uh, to guide our treatment decisions. I mean, at the end of the day, yes. you know, it's like start with the end in mind. The end is I want to get the best treatment that I possibly can or series of treatments that I possibly can to extend my life. Um, right. we, cr we Clearly, we don't have enough data right now to be able to do that. Uh, and there is data. The point here is we have huge amount of data in our, uh, right now. As I said, millions of data points in omics data. For sure, we have a clinical data, electronic data. Um, my point, as you mentioned, is the mainly thing here, we can uh, uh, run the same stone to the tip of the mountain. Again, it's going to roll back, and we are doing the same thing again and again and again. Because our solution uh, right now depends on uh, answering those questions, depends on the data. If we don't have that data, just meetings every week, repeating almost the same thing again and again is not going to help anybody. Uh, as I said, maybe by chance, yes, but not based on the data. Yeah. That's that's something I, I think uh, we should have a focus, even with about a couple of questions. Let's focus on a couple of questions, see how we can find the best answer based on the uh, based on the existing data. If you don't have access, see how we can access to that data. Mm -hmm. And I see the uh, great team here. Everybody can take some part of this task and we can reach to our goal. And it's going to be one uh, good exercise and example use case for many other groups. This Thank is you. not just a problem of this group. This is the problem for every aspect of the medical data related uh, problems we have. Rebecca, you have your hand up. Let's... Yeah, so uh, awesome presentation. And you know, this just makes me think about a lot of things that I've been working on around data. And what I did not share with you at the beginning is I've been working on real world data initiatives since 2011. Um, of various types. So I completely agree one of the, the small, small cohort, but there are, you know, definitely other cohorts to match up to um, that can be significant. Um, one of the things I've witnessed, is, especially as you guys have all experienced in community, you know, urology and uh, uro-oncology is that, you know, no surprise is that a lot of these tumors are not being profiled. Um, I have a relationship with a very, very large urology group that actually has a database of real world data patient outcomes, and they haven't been profiling their patients. And this is more recent for them because of looking at targeted therapy options. It's just newer to them. But I'm wondering if there's not an opportunity to sync up with groups like this who are very large urology practices 
Janssen has a really huge interest in, you know, some of the work that they're doing and to say, hey, we have these interesting things based on the way we were treated. Maybe, you know, maybe these are the kind of patients you should be profiling, kind of helping them also to identify the best patients to profile just as a starting point. And it's just food for thought. But I think that these are oppor huge opportunities, although this is a small cohort now of where you could start looking at comparative analysis um, with things that have actually not been done um, to help other patients. So food for thought. Um, but I love where you guys are going with that and also agree. I think there's opportunities for you guys to automate some of this. There's, I could see that there's a lot of manual work, as you stated, Brian, up front. Um, but I think that there's some opportunities with some, uh, you know, existing databases, um, to make your guys life a lot easier, as well as kind of control your data as a community of people that can compare and use that data with other data sets without losing the integrity of your own, you know, community of data. <laughs>